Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Flip Flops and People Ops, the show I made up because I'm obsessed with turning your company into a great place to work, and I have a lot to say about how to do that. The show is brought to you by Pingboard, the company I work at, who's nice enough to let me have a microphone and share with you all the research I've done, the conversations I've had with people just like you, and draw on my own experiences as an employee about what makes a company a great place to work. And that's exactly why I'm recording today's episode. I talk a lot lately about how employee experience and employee engagement are different. And if you're new to that concept, let me quickly explain that to you before I tell you my story. Everyone's so focused on driving engagement and your CEO's like, why are people disengaged? And you're like, I don't know. I don't have time to figure it out. I'm just, you know, running payroll compliance, benefits, policies, hiring, firing, and employee onboarding and making sure everyone's just generally okay. Let me figure out why everyone's quitting and not productive. It's hard. But that's the problem. Everyone's focused on driving engagement. That's the output. The input is optimizing your employee experience. The employee experience is all the little interactions and mini moments that an employee has working at your company from how meetings happen. How are they onboarded? What's their team like? How does their manager treat them? Do they have access to the right tools, systems, and and all that, yada, yada. I will link out to the employee hierarchy of needs. There are basic needs that need to be met. It's just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you quite literally have to have a house and food before you worry about, do I have friends? Am I loved? Am I reaching my highest self? There is a hierarchy of employee needs that have to happen and unfold in a certain order for it to mean anything. So the employee experience is what drives engagement. You find and fix the broken moments of your employee experience and you will drive engagement. But because HR and people ops are often so burned out and the last to get headcount, budget, resources, it's hard to figure out why exactly your people are not thriving. But the best way for all of us to learn new concepts for what I just said to make sense is for me to tell you a story. And that's what I'm gonna do tonight. I'm gonna tell you about two very different employee experiences personally. I'm not going to name companies. It doesn't matter because this is the same song and dance, no matter what company you're at. Now that I've done all this research, I can't fault most companies. They're trying to drive revenue. Revenue first companies pay for it in the long run, because when you don't put your people first, that's where you get all your quiet quitting, your broken systems, your people who just generally aren't optimizing or caring, or everyone just kind of has this underlying feeling of yuck. That's because your company cares about revenue first, then customers, then your people, whatever's left over. A people first company and a true people first company has a CEO who's like, listen, if we put our employees first, meaning they tell us what they need and when they tell us what it's like to work at our company and we listen and we optimize and we take it seriously, then they will treat our customers better. They will build a better tool. We will create a better offering which leads to more revenue. They treat each other nicely. They're happy to be there. They go above and beyond. That's driving engagement. That's an engaged company. A people first company has an engaged workforce. A revenue first company thinks they do. They think they're doing all the right things by sending Grubhub gift cards. And they're wondering why they miss their revenue targets, why their customers churn and why they have so many bugs in their product and people quit because they care about money first. Listen, if you want your company to fail, care about revenue first. If you want your company to make it, put the people first. The revenue will come very shortly after. Back to my story. I joined the workforce in 2011. It's when I graduated college, walked across the stage, got in my car and drove straight to Austin, Texas and got my first job. And I can still remember walking in for my interview and seeing the beard tap and was like, oh, these things are real. These companies really do exist. I can remember hearing the ping pong game going on and looking at the people who were a little older than me, who were probably developers and just being like, don't they have work to do? This is, this is incredible. Those people are playing and seeing conference rooms that were named after star Wars characters. And I was like, I have made it. This is it. I'm going to work in tech. And the interview process was muddy at best kind of intimidating, very confusing. I went through many rounds of interviews before I was finally offered a role of which wasn't the role I applied for and was still kind of unclear when I was offered the role. I was like, all I know is I work here now. I remember calling my brother and being like, dude, I got offered my first job out of college and there's beer on tap and there's coffee and there's a ping pong table. And he was, he's a little bit older than me. He was like, oh my God. I was like, rude, first of all. 
So I show up for my first day, just kind of knowing the address. No one reached out to me. I just kind of showed up. I asked around what to do and people made me feel a little stupid. They were like, I don't know who you are either. Sorry, I work on this team. The HR person's over there. And I walked up to this person and I said, hi, I'm Christy, I'm here for my first day. And they kind of looked at me like, what? Cool, great. They weren't expecting me. She looked at a pile of laptops and kind of grabbed one, had a piece of tape on it, had someone else's name and said, here you go. And I said, this is mine. And she kind of looked at me like, "Uh uh-huh. Now walk away. I said, do you care where I sit? And I remember her being like, no. Okay. So I go and walk over to this cluster of somewhat empty cubicles. And this friend of mine, Jacob, who's still one of my best friends to this day, because this experience was traumatizing. You can see where this is going. I sat down. I was like, hi. He was like, hi. I said, I'm new. He goes, me too. I said, I just started today. He was like, me too. I started like 20 minutes ago. And another person walked in and walked up to the HR person who I kind of eerily watched them go through the same thing I just went through. The HR person was like, who are you? And she pointed to me from across the room and I was like, hi. And the person walks over and she goes, they gave you my laptop. And I was like, you're what, what? And she pointed to my laptop and it had a piece of tape on it and it said, Lauren. And she was like, I'm Lauren, that's my laptop. And I was like, oh, sorry. And I gave it to her and she took it and she sat next to me and then I didn't have a computer. (laughs) And I was like, huh, I mean, I'm 22. I didn't know anything. And I walked back over to the HR person. I'm like, I'm sorry to bug you. And seriously, this person was so frustrated. She looked up, she's like, let me guess, you need a computer. I was like, "Uh uh-huh. So I ended up getting another computer after I accidentally was given someone else's and somehow that was my fault. And Uh, I go back to my desk, I sit down and I'm like, okay, working in tech is hard. I got this. I'm looking around for my, my new boss, the person who offered me the job and I don't see him anywhere. And I start asking around. I just, I'm, I've always been somewhat extroverted with a capital E. So I have no problem walking up to people and being like, hi, I have a question. So I'm going around trying to find other team leaders. I'm, I'm trying to introduce myself saying, I can't find my boss. Do you know who this person is? And come to find out, my boss left for a three-week vacation and was completely out of office and not doing email at all because I sent him an email and said, hey, I heard you're on vacation. Just let me know what you want me to work on. And I got an out of office that was like, I am not checking email. And I was a little scared because I thought, well, geez, what do I work on? And if I don't turn anything in for three weeks, am I going to get fired? So I didn't sleep for like a week. I was very stressed out, but somehow still having fun because again, I didn't know any better. Fast forward, I reflect back on that now and I I feel so bad for that young woman who was fresh out of college, just trying to get started and do her best. And I was not equipped. I did not stay at that company for very long. My boss was cold, confusing. And if you tried to ask clarifying questions, you were met with perceived anger a little bit of intimidation and just the team was cutthroat. If you tried to ask team members questions or collaborate, it was met with a feeling of like, figure it out. I don't know, because everybody else was struggling. We weren't having our basic needs met very well. And I went through a couple companies like that, but it felt like every two years I was like, okay, this company, isn't it? I don't like the way they're treating the employees. I don't like the way they're treating me. I'm stressed out. I try to say, this is too much work, or can we do it this way? Or I think there's a better way to do this. And I met with nothing. I met with just get it done. And this was at the height of what I remember as hustle culture. If you want to make money, if you want to be successful, you just get it done at any cost. So I went through this for, for probably seven, six, seven years. And it was the same characters at every company, the same bosses, the same burned out teams who were biting each other's heads off, just trying to get it all done, trying to save their own position and maintain who they were on the team. It was just toxic. I remember getting ready to walk down the aisle before my wedding day and opening an email because that was the culture of one of the companies. And my boss was like, why didn't you do this? And I'm like, do this thing that you didn't ask me to do. I'm about to walk down the aisle. Do you need me to do it? And she was like, yes. And I was sitting in my wedding dress and my Maid of honor went to go get my computer so I could do this report in Salesforce and send it to her. A report that she needed for a meeting she was going to that I wasn't even a part of. Another boss later in life, I had my daughter, my first child, and 
I remember it was her four month appointment and I worked hard. I've always worked hard. I've always, I don't sit back and just let life unfold. I like to be involved. I like to do a good job. So when her appointments came around, and if you've had children, you know, when you first have a newborn, you have a newborn appointment. And then there's a one week appointment, a two week, four week, a month. And then every couple months, just to check, is the baby healthy? Is the baby on track? You have to check for, for health issues. And it was her four month appointment. And I was so excited because I wanted, I enjoyed these appointments and she was thriving. And I, the doctor's office was right down the street and my house wasn't that far. And my husband was going. And I remember telling my boss a few days before, Hey, my daughter's got her four month appointment. So I'm going to take my lunch to go do this. And it, I wasn't even taking time off. It was like, I'm going to take my lunch. And I remember this, the look on this person's face. And this man was in a different generation. He was older than me, but he had adult children. And unfortunately he told me and judged me and said, you're going to go to your daughter's appointment. And what if it takes longer than your lunch? It'll probably take longer. So are you sure? And I was scared because I needed the money. I needed a job. So unfortunately, this is one of my biggest regrets. I didn't go to that appointment. I didn't go to a few appointments because I prioritized my job over going to my daughter's well check. My daughter. I only have one daughter and one son. And I, I didn't go to these appointments for her. And I just, I think back on that and I think it's not just what a shame. It's just, how could you do that to me? How could you put me in a position to where I felt like I had to choose my daughter or, or my job? And unfortunately, I made the wrong decision. I stayed at work because I was scared. So I have my daughter, I'm working, I'm, I have no hobbies, I have no work-life balance, I don't go to the gym. There is no healthy anything going on. All I do is work, rush home, hold my daughter for a second, put her to bed and lay awake at night staring at the ceiling because I'm so stressed out. And my life is so different now, that's why I chuckle because I'm like, I can't believe that was my life. So I finally hit that plateau, that like two year plateau with, with that company. And I was like, okay, time to move on. Maybe at the next company, it'll be right. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And I remember coming across this job description that from the moment I read it, I was like, this company's different. I'm intrigued. That's why you should pay attention to even the mini moments of what does your job description sound like? Is your job description good? Use chat GPT. If not, I'm making a video for that shortly, but I come across this job description that's written all about the people. The job description is written very clear. It's very easy to understand. It's fun. It lists the values, the company's mission, the purpose of the company, what they're trying to achieve, what they do. I understand in a second, what my role would be, who I would report to, what success looks like in the role. I mean, this job description knocked me on my butt. It was so good. I applied, I got a phone call immediately. They set up a phone screen. The interview process was seamless, very easy. The recruiter was over communicative, very friendly. I had a great meeting with who would be my manager. And this person was kind, asked me a lot of questions about myself. It was, it was some of the best interviews I've ever, ever had. And I get offered to work at this company. It was just like, off to the races. They pre-boarded me. They celebrated me. I got this great welcome email with a link to an org chart. I got this really kind email from my soon to be manager saying really what he enjoyed about me in the interviews and why he thought my skill set was, was a great match. And I was so excited to start with this company. So I show up on my first day and I had directions, a map. Here's pictures of the elevator. We're going to meet you. There was a person with a sign. I felt silly, but like so flattered and I remember getting there and getting to my desk and my manager and everyone was standing there. I was like, hi, this was a somewhat bigger company, maybe 400 employees. And they were like, Hey, welcome. We're going to walk you to your onboarding. And I just thought that meant let's go to HR. They walked me to a classroom where we had a person whose full-time job it was to onboard employees. And I spent a week and a half in this onboarding with people of all different roles across the company. And all of us were new though, that's what we had in common. We had a new executive, people from customer success, support, sales, marketing, product. I mean, it was a hodgepodge of, of people, but the thing we had in common was that we didn't know how to walk the walk or talk the talk yet. And they took a week. They walked us through, what industry are we in? Who are our best customers? Why? What do we sell? What problem are we solving? How long have we been in business? Who are the executives? What role and what department are we in? We role played the elevator pitch. We were taught and trained on this, this way to talk about the company that was very easy. And we practiced on each other and it was fun and funny. And they fed us and our bosses would come in and peek their head in and be like, how's it going? And we'd be like, it's going great. And we all bonded. We were like the new hire class. There was a name for our class. We were the coyotes or something. It was adorable. 
And before onboarding was over, I remember that person who trained us was like, if you have any questions at any point about how to do your job or what we do here, please come to me because that was my job. And I want feedback on how to do better. I'll send you a survey too. And I'm going to send you a survey in a few months when you're really into your role. So I can see if there were any other things that you would have been nice to know. And I remember thinking this company is, they've got it together. And if they did nothing else than this onboarding, I still would have been like super impressed, but it got better. I joined my team when onboarding was over. There was like this big, like big pit. I don't know what else to call it. This big room where everyone's desks were on one of the floors. Like everyone cheered when we came out. I was like, I feel like I'm getting ready to get on the spaceship and like go to the moon. I mean, I feel. And when it was over, we went into this big, one of the big rooms on the floor I was working on of the several floors of this company. And everyone was cheering like a new class is done. And we walked to our desk and our desk was decorated. Our team was there. I remember my manager smiling, the most authentic smile. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's actually excited that I work here. So now I feel excited to work here. And my team was kind, smart. We had goals. Our goals were clear. They were written in a way that were achievable they were discussed. I remember my one-on-ones with my manager were like, these are your goals. What keeps you up at night? What are you thinking? What are your ideas? And we would chit chat through that. But then he would also be like, how are you doing? Where can I be more or less involved in your day? Like the the perfect open-ended questions of to get me to explain what I needed. And our one-on-ones evolved over time as I got more comfortable in that role, I would come to him with problems and he wouldn't fix them for me. He would, which is a mistake a lot of managers make. He would talk with me in a way that I could come to the solutions to my own problems, but he was guiding me to the most emotionally mature, soft skilled, this is how you level up kind of solutioning for me. And I just adored that manager. And when I worked at that company, I was also pregnant with my son. And I remember coming to him and saying, I have an appointment. This is normal for pregnancy. I have to like go get tests done. And like, this is for an hour, like every two weeks I have to go to the doctor. And he was like, totally great. Thanks for letting me know, but like you go. And I remember thinking that's it because I had been through hell from managers who made me feel bad for prioritizing my family and made me feel like that was selfish. And I learned that that's not how you get ahead. And this manager healed me of all of that anxiety. And I even was able to share with this manager, Hey, I think I've been traumatized by some past managers. And when I told him a few things, he was like, uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that with me. If you're good, then your work is good. Then the company is good. Like just take care of yourself. Take however much time you need. I know you'll get your job done. Let me know how I can help. I felt like the shelter dog who was like, really? you're going to let me in here and just like do my best. And you're going to care about me regardless. Like, okay. That company was incredible. I can remember they fed us, you know, not every company can afford to do that. And especially some of you who are remote and all that, but they fed us and we would eat together across teams and laugh. And, but we would talk about work and it wasn't like, Oh, we have this meeting coming up. It's like, how are you going to achieve this goal? Because I have an idea. I heard that this is your goal. And like, have you thought about this? And then, no, I hadn't. Thank you. But do you know who has access to this and this? How can we do a webinar about this? Who owns webinars? This person, I need to talk to them. Oh, they're great. I've worked with them before. I mean, it was just electric. I never thought I was smart enough or talented enough to work for a Google or a Facebook at the time when that was exciting and, and some kind of huge achievement, but I was getting to experience that working for this company here in Austin who was putting their people first and time flew at that company, but for the right reasons, I can remember being so excited to get to work, to see my best friends. Those people became, I was so close with my team. We were all very different and we had isms. And if we had problems, we worked them out. If we had misunderstandings, it was met with love and like it brought us closer. I I can't describe it any other way other than it was just, it was magic. I hope everybody gets a chance to experience this at least once in their life because it changed my life. My team overachieved their goals every quarter and they weren't easy goals. I can remember every time getting our goals and being like, Oh crap. Uh, these are big. And I remember my manager would look at us and be like, we'll figure it out. I know we can do it. That's the point of these is to like push us. And we did every time we never missed a goal. One time, one of my goals was to get a certain amount of webinar registrants for a quarter. And I got it in the first webinar and we even broke the platform during the webinar. We had to, to level up our, our subscription so that we could let more people in. Anyway, this company was great. And one day I walked in, I was eight and a half months pregnant with my son and we got this very cryptic, 
message in the general channel. And it was from our CEO who was very fun loving and silly and charismatic, but it didn't match his tone. And it was like, Hey, we're having an emergency, all hands, everyone meet in this area where we normally have our meeting. And everyone was like, "Uh Oh, and we all slowly filed in. I remember it was early in the morning because everyone was still eating breakfast tacos. And you could just tell though, everyone was like, something's not right. Normally at our all hands, there was music. There was a theme. There was like, this time there was no bubbles. There was no costumes. There was no lighting. I mean, they took, they took every moment very seriously and they were crafting a, an experience every step of the way. But instead it was just like harsh lighting and our executive team was sitting on a stage all weird. And our CEO just kind of looked at them and looked at everyone and wasn't smiling and it just, everything felt wrong. He stood up and he grabbed the microphone and he said, there's no easy way to say this. So I'm just going to say it. We are merging with another company and we've been acquired. I don't know if you've ever been fired, but if if you have, once those words come out, you don't really hear anything else. You're just you're like, what? I don't really remember what else was said other than I just remember looking around and I remember holding the person next to me's hand. It was my best friend on the team. And just like, she started bawling. We all just knew everything was gonna change. I'd never been through a merger or an acquisition, but I, I could tell in sense that others were like, this is not good. This is, this is, it's not gonna be the same. I went on maternity leave that next day, which didn't feel good because when you go through a merger, you're smashing two companies together. You have two of everything, two CMOs, two VPs of marketing, two heads of sales, two directors of sales, two, two of everything, two managers of, of the people, two, two of the actual frontline people doing the work. You have to make hard decisions of who's going to stay and who do we need and, and what's redundant. And I went on maternity leave, not knowing if I was going to be fired because I'm the feeble pregnant woman, who knows? I don't know. That's what my brain did was like go into protection mode. Like I'm just going to assume I'm going to get let go. At least I'll get a severance. I'll try to, to get some sleep, raise this kid for six weeks and get back. And slowly I had my son, the company still sent me the most lovely stuff and gifts. And I got phone calls and people were so kind. My best friends were just so, my friends at that company were incredible. Some still friends, a lot of them still friends today. And I have my son and I'm, I remember being so tired. If you've had children, you know, those first days home are just a blur. You sleep, you take naps basically, if you're lucky. And I was on one of those no sleep vendors and I get a phone call and I see it's my boss. And I'm like, oh man, here we go. And I answer the phone. He's so nice. He's like, Hey, how's the baby? You know, he opens with, how's the baby? How are you? You know, those little touches, but it was real. He cared about that stuff. So I told him, I was like, we're doing great. You know, I'm dying to know what the heck is going on over there. What's going on? What updates do you have? And he goes, well, I have some great news. According to how we did goals on our team, I was able to advocate for you, even though you weren't here and you couldn't go through your interview to be like, tell us what you do here. What, you know, everyone had to go through this really painful, awkward, like meeting with this company that acquired us to figure out who they were going to keep and not. He goes, I kind of did your meeting for you. And because you achieved your goals, I was able to advocate that you're a rock star and they should keep you. And they decided to keep you. And the relief that washed over me, we, he and I probably talked for like five minutes after that, just like, oh my gosh, this, this is so great. This is so incredible. I'm like, Hey, remember all these ideas we had? I've been thinking about this. Um, if you, if I was going to get kept, I thought this is how we could do it under the new brand and da, 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 da. He let me go on and on and on and on and on and on before it got to a point where I was like, and you know, you can handle this part. And, and he was like, okay, so here's the other thing I have to tell you. They did not keep me. And he had enough tact to wait and let me be excited and let me be happy just for a minute before he said, they didn't keep either person at my level. They eliminated it. You were all reporting to a VP, which I got to tell you at a company of that size is a little inappropriate for the sake of the, the types of meetings a VP is in versus the people doing the work you need and in between you need someone in strategy, someone managing and looking out for the team and then the doers. And we lost our manager looking out for the team. <laughs> and I remember thinking, how stupid, how, how is this possibly, what, how was that the decision for them to get rid of you? But then I just felt so guilty that I just spent the last five minutes celebrating and he was nice enough to just be like, uh-huh, yeah, it is great. Yes, but I'm not staying. And I cried, I bawled my eyes out. You would have thought someone told me he was killed, but I was mourning the loss of the first excellent manager I'd ever had. And the first manager who made me not scared to go to work, the first manager who made me feel like I could fail and learn and he wouldn't 
hold my feet to the fire, he would be like, okay, what are we going to do different? He was, he was great. He cared about me. He cared about my family. He cared about the team. He knew how we all were different, but fit together perfectly. So I went through the rest of my maternity leave and I got a couple other sad phone calls where friends would call and be like, I have had enough. This, this new company, the way that we're doing this, this is crazy. I can't do it. I'm quitting. Or people would call and say, I got the news that I got let go. And just so many emotional conversations while I'm already raising my second child, very sleep deprived. It was very stressful. So I get ready to come back for my first day. And I remember checking my email a few days before because I just couldn't help myself. I just wanted to clean things up. And I had gotten an email a week before from my my new boss, who was a VP from the other company. And she said, where are you? in the email. And it was from a week ago. And I was like, where are you? No one told her I'm on maternity leave. And turns out she was told, but she didn't get it or she didn't catch it. But she sent me this really scary email that was basically like, why aren't you reporting to work? And then sent me another email a couple of days later and was like, I couldn't figure out where you were and why you weren't coming and like went to HR. And it turns out you're on maternity leave. So I figured it out. It wasn't like, sorry, <laughs> it was just weird and scary and stressful. So I go back and i've got my computer it's the same office but it's so heavy it's not right it's new faces and i'm like walking by and like old faces and people are like hey and before i went back to my desk i sat in an old conference room where we used to watch our executives as we would go by to lunch or go by to go get coffee and we loved our executives we respected them we believed in them and when we would see them in this one meeting room that really nobody ever booked because it was for like the the big dogs and we would see them and like oh there they are and we would wonder what they were talking about and and they would be really animated and they would be doing whiteboard stuff and just when our executives saw you they they would greet you they would they were kind they would smile they would say hi the whole everything about the company was so classy everything about the company was about the people and making everyone feel comfortable and feel seen and heard our executives were great that room was dark when i walked in and it was had stacks of turned in laptops and equipment. And I was like, oh my God, what like a digital graveyard. I'm just gonna hide in here for a second. I've always wanted to kind of like be in this room. I go in this room, I open my computer and I open up Pingboard because the company that hired me that was so incredible was using Pingboard. I got a welcome email when they first hired me. It was like, this is the org chart. You can explore it before you start. That was how I put my statuses in that I was going to my maternity appointments and my manager would get a notification and then be like, how was the appointment? Do you need anything? Are you good? That's how I learned who was who and who did what. And back then we didn't have a he as heavy of a feature set as we do now. I didn't work at Pingboard yet. It didn't have a one-on-ones feature. It didn't have a surveys feature, but I can remember as an employee, this tool made my employee experience incredible. It's where I went to when I was like, I need to work on this. How, who owns this? Or like, who is the admin of this tool? I could see who had dogs, who had kids, who came from Austin, who's from Chicago. It was the tool I went to, to feel really connected to everybody and see how I fit into the bigger picture, even before I started. And it was the tool I used to, to make sense of things as I sat in that conference room by myself alone, crying, missing my son, missing my daughter, back to work, scrolling through Pingboard, trying to figure out who was left, reading employee profiles to figure out who the new people were, trying to figure out who my new boss was. Turns out I didn't end up staying at that company for very long, but the few days and weeks I was able to make it, it was because I was using Pingboard as a lifeline. As an employee at that company, mourning the loss of this great place to work and what we were now under this rebrand and this merger, I was just using that tool as my my way of making sense of anything and processing the grief I had over over this merger and this big change, trying to make sense of any of it. That's that's the way I did it. That's the way I hung on even as long as I did. I no longer work at that company. I now work at Pingboard. It turns out that next manager wasn't very interested in in you know the people and what they needed, and and that's okay. That's how some companies operate. That's not how I wanted to work anymore. Now that I had a taste of greatness. And you know what? This company wasn't Google, IBM, or, or Facebook. It was it was a, just a, a really well put together tech company that put their people first. I'll just never forget sitting there and being like, it's all over. It's different now. Can I fall in? So yeah, I now work at Pingboard. I host our podcast. I have helped ship and 
think through new features like our one-on-ones feature. We are not just an org chart anymore. We have surveys to figure out what's broken or missing from the employee experience. It's automated because HR and people ops are busy. We now have onboarding checklists. The tool has gotten more and more close to really being that lifeline for employees no matter what and helping HR and people ops who are already very busy to deliver a better employee experience no matter what stage the company's in and no matter what's happening at the company, Pingboard's kind of like that, that stable, like, but here's the access to the basic information so that your basic needs are met. You need to know who's who, who does what, when, where, how, why. You need to be able to tell HR what's going on, what could be better. You need to be able to meet with your manager and have a very productive conversation about how you're doing, what you need, what needs to change, what's going great, what's not. You need a feedback loop. What I can say to you, as a listener, you're likely in HR or people ops, or you're, you're being tasked with driving engagement. Grubhub gift cards, Silly Hat Day and Cat Day aren't it. Having tools, whether it's Pingboard or something else, having the right tools to help you automate some of your job so that you can focus on how the people are doing and think through how to do better, but also that can just help your employees feel like they know how they're connected to the company as a whole, how they ladder up to the big picture, where do they fit in? That's how you deliver a better employee experience at a very basic level. I've never been so engaged or so impressed than when I first logged into Pingboard and was like, ah, they have an org chart that updates automatically, but sure, that's a feature. What it gave me is peace of mind and a mind map of where do I fit into this organization? Who else is there for me to know about? How do they all work together? And What's more about the person? Go into employee profiles and just see who is this person? How would I communicate with them? How would I work with them? Tell me a little bit more about them outside of work so that when I do meet them, I have some context. If your people are quiet quitting or disengaged, there might be really easy ways for you to meet them at their basic needs. Pingboard is one of those tools. It helps you work smarter, not harder, and it delights and surprises your new hires and is a resource for your tenured employees to just feel like they know what's going on. When you can make announcements and push them to Slack, when you can send a survey and not have to manually remind everyone or close it, when you have a place to look, here's the next, here's one new hire class, here was another new hire class. You can group and categorize people and show them all the things they have in common. Some people are visual learners, some people are auditory learners. You can see name pronunciation. It's just, it's the basics. Your employees want to feel like this is a place worth spending their time. And when you have a tool that delivers a better employee experience and helps you work smarter and not harder, you're solving your needs while also helping drive engagement by filling in the gaps of, of what other companies leave. Other companies really don't get this part right. So you will find that employees are like, I've, this company's incredible. Even if you're just offering something like Pingboard, that automatically updates. It, it integrates with your payroll or your HRIS system to always show who works here. If someone leaves, Pingboard updates. If someone joins, Pingboard updates. It shows who they report to. It's They get an email to go fill out their profile. People can see what they have in common. It's just, we're all giving our most precious resource by working at a company, which is our time. You want to make it as delightful as possible, but sometimes you don't know how. Now that I've been on both sides of the tracks, I have seen firsthand delivering a better employee experience drives engagement. You don't have to be perfect. All employees want to see is effort. They want to feel like they know what's going on and they don't want to feel scared. They want to feel equipped and they want to just feel like they have the right tools available to them to give their best. That's it. Salary won't do it. Salary's not enough. Most companies can't afford it anyway. So don't worry about that part. You should pay people appropriately, but that's my ping board story. I work here now. I enjoyed the product so much. I've now worked here for almost four years. Pingboard isn't at the size of this company that I worked at. They had more resources and more employees and, and they had funding in a different way than we do. I'm enjoying Pingboard too. Pingboard's in that pre, oh my gosh, things are great, but they're about to be incredible. And I'm just so proud of the company I work for. And I wanted to tell you all, I talk about Pingboard because it worked for me. I experienced it firsthand and it can work for you too. It can help you drive engagement in a very meaningful way that you will have your Cinderella story of, I took a very toxic, quiet quitting, apathetic workforce and had this Cinderella story with a CEO who knew we could do better. And we did, and we, we started with a tool like Pingboard just to give a better employee experience. If you ever have questions about employee experience or, or where you could be going wrong with, you feel like you don't have enough time or resources, or you can't figure out why your people are disengaged, the answers are all there. You just have to get really good at talking to your people and creating a feedback loop and being a people first company for real. 
that means listening to my show and learning how to do a great all hands, learning how to train your managers, workshop your managers like the one I had. He went through management workshopping. I later found out he was like, oh my God, we were in training like once a week. I was learning new things all the time too. I was equipped because they they believed in me and gave me the space to actually run the team. This is possible for you. You can create a company like the one I worked for. Start with your CEO. Be like, are we a people first company or are we a revenue first company? Walk them through what that means. Start there. Deliver a better employee experience and you will drive engagement. And Pingboard's a great tool that can help you get there. Thanks for always listening to the show. I can't believe it took me two years into the show to even tell you all I used Pingboard as an employee at a previous company and that's why I work here. That's why I host our podcast and that's why I'm obsessed because I lived it. And thanks for listening to this single mom rant. I'll see you guys next time.